Hello, everyone. My name is Russ Gannam, and I'm Associate Provost and Dean of International Programs at the University of Iowa. It is my great pleasure to be with you today as we bring you the fall edition of our Global Alumni Spotlight Series. Please let me thank our communications and relations team and international programs for their help in putting together today's program. And before we get too much farther, please let me state that we'll invite the audience to submit questions via the Q&A function and that we will reserve time at the end of the interview for these questions. The goal of the Global Alumni Spotlight Series is to showcase the accomplishments of UI graduates who are either from international destinations and or who have distinguished themselves in global venues. Membo Changula fits this definition perfectly and we are delighted she has agreed to visit us uh, from her home in, in Tan Tanzania today. Membo Nchimunya Changula has a Bachelor of Science in Urban and Regional Planning from the Copper Belt University in Kitwe, Zambia. She earned a Master of Science in Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Iowa in 2010, where she studied as a Fulbright Scholar, graduating with double specializations in economic development, land use, and environmental planning. The program's research-oriented focus on analytical urban planning, public policy, and sustainability had a significant formative role in her urban planning career. For an international student, Iowa also provided a warm multicultural learning environment in which she forged many lasting relationships. After graduating, Memba went on to work in Zambia's Ministry of Local Government in various positions, her last being Principal Officer for Forward Planning. Here she provided leading expertise in sustainable urban development at the national, regional, and local level while pioneering several urban policy reform initiatives. She was also the national point person for UN Habitat, leading Zambia's contribution to global development frameworks such as SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals on sustainable cities and communities. She also worked on the new urban agenda and served on the National Lands Tribunal. In 2021, Membo decided to take her urban planning career to the international development field, joining ICLEI Africa as a senior professional officer in urban planning. In her new role, she is the project manager on the World Bank funded urban planning and development control strengthening program in Tanzania. Between Zambia and Tanzania, her work has centered on Southern Africa and East Africa. Membo has also actively served in professional leadership roles and was previously honorary secretary of the Zambia Institute of Planners and president of the Zambia USA Exchange Alumni Association. Membo Changula, it is an honor and a privilege to welcome you to our Global Alumni Spotlight Series. And thank you for being here. And uh, it is uh, uh, late in the evening in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam, isn't it? It's uh, uh, 8.30 p.m. So we are in the middle of the day. You are concluding yours. And so we are especially grateful for to you for adjusting to this, this, this time, uh, time zone difference. And it's great to have you with us today. So, um, Mumbo, there's, there's much to talk about, um, but let's start with the basics. Just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and where you're from and what kind of work you do. Uh, okay, um, thank you so much for that very um, warm welcome and all those great words that you have. <laughs> I feel really humbled with all of those nice words, uh, but well, um, like you introduced me, my name is Membo Nchimunya Changula. Uh, I am from Zambia and I'm an urban and regional planner. Um, I, I studied urban and regional planning, so that's my profession. I, uh, I grew up in Zambia. Uh, um, I've, done, I've lived most of my life in Zambia, but uh, just the last 13 months, uh, uh, I've been in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam, on a project, like you mentioned, the World Bank project. Um, well, yes, that, that's basically about me from that. All right, angle. very good, very good. Yeah. And then so, um, Membo, um, one question I always like to ask in these interviews is, what makes you curious? 
And um, how have you followed your curiosity uh, throughout your life and, and career? Um, and what mm -hmm. makes you, and what things are you still curious about? <laughs> okay, so I, I'm one person that has a, a keen desire uh, to see other people thrive. And I, I had that, I've had that desire since, since I was young, you know, I, would, I love people and because I love people, I get concerned about their well-being and growing up in the kind of environment that I grew up in, in a developing uh, country setting, I interacted with people from all walks of life. And I realized that this, the, the, there was a difference, um, a difference in how people lived and in what they had access to. Uh, I, I could clearly see that there was the well-off and the not so well-off. And that, re that, that, the, the, that, that, that contrast really uh, made me more curious to say, okay, so what, what, what makes people live better than others? And I think at that young age, I began to see issues of, of, of equity uh, and, um, and, uh, and also of, of, of equality as well, where I, I became aware of, of, uh, uh, of, of the, the distinct inequalities that we have in our, in, our, in our settings in the developing country context. And I'm, this is something which is there all over the world anyway, you have the rich and the poor. And I began to see things also from the spatial side. And I think uh, that, that that really began to, the spatial side in, in terms of space, uh, mm -hmm. because you, you would have, um, I, I came from, uh, I, I lived in, a, in an urban setting that had access to all the services that we needed, all the facilities and amenities. And basically it was a good living environment, but I had a lot of friends and relatives who were living in these crowded areas, um, uh, poor housing conditions. So I think I, I, I noticed that, that that stark difference. And usually you'd find that these neighborhoods were next to each other. So I think that that really uh, began to build my passion to be able to, 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 be, to, to, to see how I could find solutions to, um, to, to level the, 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 the field, in other words, to, to, to level, to, to level the, 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 up the, the, the development playing field for for all so that um, I could see how others, uh, I, could, I could help those that were not privileged to get access to the opportunities that, that, that the privileged had. And that drew me to a career in urban and regional planning uh, because with urban and regional planning, um, one of the things that, um, is, uh, that, 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 that is the focus uh, of, of urban and regional planning is to, to try to, to build inclusivity uh, and uh, to break those barriers between um, uh, neighborhoods, uh, whether it's the slum, between the slums and uh, the well-planned neighborhoods. And also uh, beyond that, just to, to give people equal opportunity in terms of from the social perspective, the economic perspective, and even the environmental perspective. So I think that, that, that I see that as having built my, my passion for urban and regional planning even before um, getting into studying um, um, uh, urban planning, uh, but also it also points to, to sustainability because my 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 work has been all about you know pursuing the sustainability agenda, and it has both people at, as a focus and also the environments that we live in as a focus. Right. Well, I mean that's so interesting because you know with respect to urban and regional planning, and believe me, I'm not an expert. But I think uh -huh. that a lot of times people walk into a city or a town mm -hmm. and they think that it was all planned, that there was, you know, it was planned from the beginning, um, mm -hmm. that there's, you know, not really a lot of spontaneity, that things just didn't happen haphazardly, um, that there is a purpose and a focus to mm -hmm. the way a particular town or city is laid out. Now, in some cases that, that may be true, but mm -hmm. in other cases, you know, um, they're really, especially in older cities, there probably wasn't much planning, or at least there wasn't much effective planning, that things mm -hmm. sort of occurred, um, oh, I don't want to say spontaneously, uh, but, but in a way that wasn't, you know, necessarily well thought out, uh, mm -hmm. or one that really didn't keep in mind, you know, issues of equity 
or access or inclusion and that there were sort of class differences or maybe political differences mm -hmm. that ended up you know constructing cities that uh quite frankly kept people apart rather than bringing them together is that is that a fair it, it, hence the need for urban and regional planning because you're kind of undoing a lot mm -hmm. of the mistakes that were mm -hmm. committed in the past is that is that a fair assumption yes i i, I believe that's a very fair assumption and when you look at how our cities have developed in the developing world, really, it's, it's very it's it's very historical. As in the roots of the way the cities look now have historical roots. I mean, I mean, I, I come from historical um, influences, mm -hmm. uh, particularly colonialism. Like we, it, uh, the colonial era um, created separate settlements that you know. You know, there was there was no thought at all about the the, the working. You know. Um, the, the working citizens uh, or the working uh, local people, uh, and then the plan, the, the environment that was planned was for you know the, the people that came to colonize us. So, right. and then you know, yeah, so you the the growth of, or for instance, the slums themselves um, have sprung out from that kind of um, uh, setting of the city at that time, and it has grown and continues to perpetuate. Uh, with with the growth of population and the like, right. And one would have to think, as you suggest, that much of your work um, is a function of uh, or involves kind of undoing the legacy of mm -hmm. colonialism and mm -hmm. trying to project a future that is more focused on the local people, the local culture, mm -hmm. what their mm -hmm. wants and needs are as opposed to some imperial power uh, you know, imposing its, its, its will for material benefit um, mm -hmm. and exploitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and then so you're on the, on the one level, you're, you're dealing with this legacy of, of oppression and colonialization on the other hand, you know, you're trying to look for the future and that's where sustainability comes in. Yeah, um, exactly. mm -hmm. and, and sustainability is probably a tricky issue as well because you're trying to develop, you know, balance the need mm -hmm. to grow the economy, mm -hmm. the need to, you know, advance development on the one hand, but also mm -hmm. preserve the environment uh, and the natural culture uh, mm -hmm. on the other. And so, how has how have you managed that that balance, uh, you know, uh, between development on the one hand, sustainability on the other, and what does sustainability mean for you in the context in which you you work? Um, okay, uh, so sustainability really is um, like you're saying, creating a balance. Because um, I think so often um, development is viewed from the economic angle mm -hmm. and um, there's very little thought to what the, the, the impact would be on, you know, on people and not just people today, but people many years from now. Right. And, and also the environmental impact right now we're dealing with climate change and we've got no one to blame but ourselves really. Uh, uh, and so, and then you, you get natural disasters as well. Some of these really are not, are, are not man-made, but um, so, when, when, but when, when you're actually thinking about development, there's need to actually think about all of these together, especially that for me, I think development really is not just about um, measuring the economic indicators, um, the growth, uh, gross domestic product, product and things like that, but it should translate to people's lives improving because really who are, who, who are we developing? Who are we planning for? Or who, who, who are the benef beneficiaries of all these development efforts? I think it's the, it, it's the people themselves. I mean, who else do we plan for? And who else do we, do, do we put all these uh, development programs in place for? So at the end of the day, especially the vulnerable needs to be included. And I think sustainability is good because it looks at that balance and more so i think 
the important thing for sustainability is the inclusiveness, because it will not make sense if you're saying we're pursuing a balance of social, economic, and environmental uh, development if it's only benefiting a, a group that is privileged. And in our African setting, we have about 70% of our population. I was talking about, um, I was describing how I got inspired um, to, to or motivated to study urban and regional planning uh, because of the inequalities. We have about seven, more than 70% of the urban population living in slums, right? So, and they are dep deprived uh, economically, socially, and even environmentally because they are very poor conditions there. and. They are prone to risks, um, health risks. Like when we had uh, COVID, it hit the, the those settlements even more than, than than the other settlements. And you're talking about seventy percent of the population. When we've had disasters, um, um, uh, they've really hit these people places because of the poor housing conditions. So there is need to skew sustainability towards the needs of the more vulnerable. I think we need to to to, to look at it from that perspective. Right. And it would seem to me that the field of urban and regional planning has to be quite interdisciplinary in its nature. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. to say that, you know, there, uh, without doubt, there is um, an architectural aspect that you need mm -hmm. to consider. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are also sociological and anthropo anthropological factors that mm -hmm. need to be taken into account. Similarly, and as you say, the, the pandemic really underscored this, uh, the public mm -hmm. health dimension <laughs> has mm -hmm. to be taken into consideration. And on a cultural level, uh, you need to be as inclusive as, mm -hmm. as possible, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that underrepresented voices are heard because they're, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they're going to be living in this new environment, in this new mm -hmm. World, uh, mm -hmm. they're going to be entrusted with its care as mm -hmm. well. So it seems to me that uh, you know between the political, architectural, uh, public health mm -hmm. angle, the socio-cultural angle, uh, mm -hmm. that you you really sort of have to verse yourself in all of these disciplines in mm -hmm. order to be an effective urban and regional planner. Um, and I'm just wondering, is that is that kind of what you studied here at Iowa when you did your degree? Well, yes, I I had well Iowa had um, the, the program at Iowa had different uh, uh, disciplines, as in as in had different uh, specializations, and um, each focusing on a different area, of course. But they there was always a linkage or integration. We start, we went to all the most like I I went to most of the classes. Um, or I got, I took most of the courses. I think I just had a, a few that I didn't take. I wasn't able to take because of, you know, I had, I had actually overloaded myself in terms of courses, but um, we still had that opportunity to actually look at how do we integrate uh, different, um, um, di different perspectives or different um, approaches, whether it's from the architectural point of view or whether it's, uh, it's from the land use and environmental point, point of view or from the, economic point of view or, mm -hmm. and the like. Um, I, 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 I managed to actually do two specializations at Iowa. Um, I, I, my initial, uh, uh, my, 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 my aim was actually to just do the economic development specialization, uh, but I, I eventually did a two, uh, uh, ended up with two specializations in economic development and in land use and environmental planning. And then, of course, there were other specializations like in housing and the like. But urban and regional planning, as it is, is, is very, very, uh, um, it's, it's a field where one is aware of other practices, whether it's in public health and how it impacts on, uh, on, on cities uh, and even from other sectors, even beyond the, 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 the planning uh, field, be it uh, maybe the health sector, the education sector, or whatever sector, because all of that um, addresses how how you're bettering people's lives, how you're, you're, you're building the mm -hmm. quality of life for people. And, 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 and urban planning, urban and regional planning actually helps to, to, to allocate in an integrated manner how, how those facilities will be spread out in space so that, you, you, so that every sector, every segment of the population has equal access. Because it will make sense to say you build a school and a, a schools and hospitals in just one location um, that has a, a, a less population and then you leave 
the majority of the population who are probably the, the more poor and need that access, you know, without those facilities. So there's that integrated uh, um, uh, uh, perspective in urban and regional planning, bringing together uh, what, what development means from different sector angles. And so at Iowa, um, clearly your, your program involved all of these different disciplines and, and elements, but I'm wondering, mm -hmm. was there a focus on the developing world uh, in, the, in the degree that you pursued here, or were the courses just sort of more, more general and they didn't really differentiate between uh, different, different regions of, of the globe? I, I think one thing I liked about the, the program at, at, at Iowa was that the, the, there was some kind of a balance um, because of course with, there was the theoretical part of it, you know, the theory itself, you can't run away from theory. Theory is the basis of every, or is the foundation of every, of, of every field, of every profession. So there was a theoretical aspect of it, but when it came to um, the application, and I can't actually even just the, the, the different case studies that would be um, exposed mm -hmm. to, and um, also try, uh, the application in terms of the practical going out in the field, uh, I think there, there was an element of trying to relate to the issues that are common, not only common between common in the U.S. and in uh, in the developing world, like issues of slums. I think we, uh, I remember uh, going to Chicago and uh, a number of uh, I think Chicago and um, the Twin Cities and a number of areas that had these this slum conditions that were very very uh, similar to what we have, and some of them even worse than what we have here. Um, in, in uh, the developing world. And apart from that, also we, we the, there was there were certain courses. I, I remember one course that I took was on international perspectives that had a, a global view to, um, to, 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 to urban planning and sustainability challenges and also took part in the Hikotepec uh, project. I believe right. it's still running. Yeah, I traveled to Mexico with a group of my uh, uh, fellow students and we put together a development plan for for Hikotopec, and you know that's a, a, a poor city, a poor town, very very much like a, like you would find in Africa, and same conditions. So we, we, I had that that experience of it wasn't just about the American way of life as we see it portrayed in the media, because I know from what I saw in America that actually there's actually both the poor, the rich, and the poor. It's not all just rosy. No, <laughs> no, not, not in the slightest. And but it's, but it's interesting, you know, that you decided to come to Iowa to pursue urban and regional planning because, you know, you look at uh -huh. Iowa as a state, it's rural. Um, uh -huh. You know, Iowa City is very pleasant and, you know, it's connected to Cedar Rapids, but it's not a huge metropolis. Uh, but uh -huh. fortunately, <clears throat> you were able to go to Chicago and Minneapolis. And so you kind of had maybe the best of, of all possible worlds in that you could study in a relatively quiet uh, place like Iowa City, um, but then do your field work in a large urban area, but also have an international experience by going to Hikotapec. I mean, and, and that's, that's a program that International Programs has been involved in. Um, you know, there, there are various um, departments that uh, participate in Hikotapec, also the local Rotary or one of the local mm -hmm. Rotary associations, um, mm -hmm. of which I'm a part, actually, uh, mm -hmm. you know, has has been a sponsor of Hikotapec. We haven't been able to, you know, move forward because of the pandemic, but hopefully next year uh, mm -hmm. we'll be able to restart that that program. But I guess, mm -hmm. you know, from from your perspective, um, you know, you had a really good balance between kind of a, a small city in Iowa City and in, in a rural state like Iowa, accessing large uh, metropolitan areas, and then going abroad, um, it probably gave you a real panoply or a full complement of experiences that you could take with you uh, once you completed your, your degree and started your, your career uh, back in Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's right. And um, uh, I just remembered one thing. I think when I was doing my my internship between my first and my second year, I decided to go all out and I went away and worked in New York City. Okay. <laughs> okay. I went to New York City and um, uh, I remember Pam at that time was our, our the secretary in the department and said, "Oh, mm -hmm. you're going all the way to New York City?" 
But anyway, that also helped me um, get a different perspective because we were dealing with urban projects in, in deprived neighborhoods in Detroit sure. in different places yeah I was I was working with an organization organization that's called living cities and we we're looking at um, uh, problematic areas in cities and uh, Philadelphia and so many other areas that we looked at in that project in that um, in that organization and coming up with solutions so but then like like uh, like um, I said earlier on um what, what I what I experienced in America, of course, it it's a bit it's a, dif it's a different setting altogether. But I saw that there's really a, com a commonality in the challenges that we are facing. We face common challenges, whether you're in a developing country or developed country. The challenges are the same. The issues of urban poverty are the same, and sometimes even worse on one end than the other. That, that, that you know beyond what you expect. So solutions that would work here in Africa, for instance, can be borrowed and you know applied in America. There's no one way of doing things. And right. the thing about actually studying in an international environment, it opens your mind to new perspectives, new ways of doing things. And I, I actually support exchange programs. If someone is going to come to from America to Africa, I would really support that because they get a different perspective. You know, sometimes what is portrayed is just a one way of doing things mm -hmm. yes and yet there's so many you know different ways of, of of doing things and i think the that ex that global exchange that international exchange is really what we should be be, be driving towards rather than just just um promoting a, a single view i think the world has be has moved beyond that single view right there's right. There's, there's a lot of wealth of knowledge that, that for instance america could gain from africa you know from zambia from tanzania where i am uh and 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 both both ways. Absolutely, there has yeah. to be a level of cooperation, a co-creative mm -hmm. process, co-learning, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and the more that we can learn from each other, uh, mm -hmm. certainly uh, the more the, the the more we will be in a position to actually solve some some of these problems. And so, I, I'm wondering. Um, what should American cities learn from your experience uh, mm -hmm. with urban planning in um, uh, East Africa and in Southern Africa? Uh, what effective strategies have been practiced, say, in Zambia and Dar es Salaam, other places that might be able to be applied here in the US, say to Chicago, Minneapolis, Detroit, or even smaller places? Um, well, in terms of uh, best practices, I, 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 I think we have a very strong community involvement in, um, in finding solutions to their, to their issues, whether it's in the urban planning field or any other field. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's one approach that I love about developing countries and Zambia and also my experience here where I am is that community involvement in finding solutions, right? You don't have to always, it's, it's, I mean, it, the government is there, of course, um, it's there to serve the people, but that dependency syndrome on government um, really would not, will not help take a community forward uh, because there, there needs to be some sort of ownership and that ownership is mm -hmm. really gained by actually being part of the development process. Being part of it means, um, you know, being part of it from the initiation, articulating your needs and being part of providing solutions to those needs. So uh, I think that is very, very important. I think America could gain from that. I know you're very strong on social security that, you know, the poor get this social pack, those pack these packages from government. Uh, but I think beyond that, there is need to to move beyond that and say, what else can you do? How can we work together, you and us, you know, the poor with government to, to make your lives better? It's not just about receiving a package at the end of the day. Right. And I think that, that in, in Africa, we have so much community mobilization um, in actually bringing up our, our development. And um, when, when, African, Af when the, the new Africa was being built after colonialism, it's actually the people people in the villages, they didn't wait on government to say, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Or who's going to fund this? Is it, um, uh, we're going to get funding from the International um, uh, Reconstruction Bank to do this? They didn't know all of that, but what they knew is we want to have better lives for ourselves. So uh, an example um, of that was, I, my, my mother talks about my, my late grandfather, mm -hmm. how he 
he came, he, he lived in the, in the village far away in the rural area, but he was amongst those that came into the city to, to build uh, the capital city when we became new, when we uh, like when we were going towards um, get, be, becoming independent. And also we had Zambians putting their resources together to build the, the, the first university, university that we have, the, the University of Zambia, which is like the largest institution um, uh, at, that high, at that level, although we've got so many universities around. But um, I'm just, what I'm trying to just say is, you see a lot of community drive, a lot of people being driven to say, what can I do to develop my environment? And I think that would help, especially in America where, you know, probably maybe you have enough money to give out to people who are poor, but they need to be part of that process as well. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. I think a lot of it comes down to decision-making, right? And so mm -hmm. who makes the decision and mm -hmm. who implements it? And so if you, you know, have the, a, a structure, either a political mm -hmm. structure or a cultural structure where the, the mm -hmm. community itself is involved and mm -hmm. is outlining its needs, um, mm -hmm. but going beyond that, making the decisions as to how these needs and these problems are going to be solved, mm -hmm. then it seems to me that you have a more effective structure uh, in order to remedy these situations, not just, and not just in terms of like solving immediate problems, but mm -hmm. also planning for the future. I mean, because that's, because that when you build up that culture of decision-making, well, then mm -hmm. that's part of sustainability too, right? Um, yes. That you've got, you know, mechanisms in place to mm -hmm. um, decide what the policies are going to be and how they're mm -hmm. going to be implemented and where the resources are going to, to come from. And, and everyone's invested. In, in one form or another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that is very, very true. I think having the right decision-making structures is, is very important because that, that way you, you're guaranteed of a more um, a streamlined process of, of, of um, contributing towards any development initiative. Very good, very good. So let's go back to Iowa for, for a second. Um, so um, you came here on a Fulbright. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, could you tell us a little bit about that process? And the reason why uh, I ask is because Iowa has had a lot of success uh, in Fulbright. You know, we've been named a top producer. We get many students who get who receive awards either uh, to teach English or to pursue research. We also receive a large number of Fulbright scholars every every year. Our faculty receive Fulbright fellowships as well. So it's a very productive type of enterprise that we have here uh, at Iowa. And you're obviously part of that. You're part of the Fulbright family. That's what we, we call it here at, at Iowa. So can you tell me um, about how you um, uh, discovered Iowa, as it were, and why you decided to come here? And how did Fulbright play a role in that process? Um. Uh, so Fulbright, uh, I, I, I came across the Fulbright uh, Fellowship uh, through an advert, and I, I thought of applying for it. The first time, I think, the first time that I saw it, I was like, I, I, was, I was not so, you know, I was like, okay, this, is, this looks good, but am I going to make it? And I was a bit skeptical about it, but I think towards the close of the application process, I just, you know, decided, okay, let me go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a lengthy process. Um, it's, it's quite a rigorous process, actually, because you go through so many selection stages and uh, you start from hundreds of applicants, then you're screened and it keeps on going, getting uh, smaller. And then you have to now sit for, um, you, you, you sit for, 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 the, for exams. I took the GRE exam, mm -hmm. the, the graduate record exam and um, the, the English um, exam as well. But the, the graduate record exam is actually quite an evolving exam because you need to go back and learn your, your, your maths, actually your statistics, addition, additional mathematics and the like, and also different um, um, uh, aspects that are, are tested in that. So I found myself amongst those that passed. And finally, I was the only one that, that made, because they, they actually had positions for both a PhD and master's, mm -hmm. and, as in one of each. So unfortunately, the person who, who was going for the PhD that had been shortlisted to that level did not make it on the first attempt of the GRE. So I ended up being the only Zambia for a while until I think they had to, they, they were, uh, there was an opportunity for people to receive and do the, 
uh, the, the GRE exam. So it, then after that, we had the two of us, uh, I'm the, me doing with me doing the masters, uh, children for the masters, and the PhD person who joined a bit later. So it was quite a, a rigorous process, and uh, I'm glad that I applied because if I had I didn't apply, I was not. I mean, I I, I hesitated at the beginning. I, I had hesitated about pl applying for it, but I'm glad I did and came to America. But the process also it involved me um, having to choose select uh, three universities. And I did my search and um, I liked University of Iowa. And actually, first of all, what drew me to Iowa was, I, I had one of my, my lecturers who um, had lectured me in my undergrad um, and he had some information about Iowa because he had information about international <clears throat> universities. And he gave me that information brochure and I, I took an interest in it and checked on it, check, out, check it out online and a number of other universities. But I, I really liked Iowa because I think it's, it seemed to provide a, a good a balance of the different uh, disciplines in urban plan, urban, urban and regional planning. And also the environment actually attracted me. I, I, I was just drawn by the autumn colors. I think the pictures were showing all the nice different colors of, of, of autumn and actually came and uh, uh, the fall colors. And I came and actually experienced that when I came to Iowa and just a very peaceful and serene environment, even if it, it was, it's, less, it's, it's, it's less dense than most cities Mm -hmm. around there yeah but I, I i really liked it for that because it was an environment i could focus on my studies and, and actually enjoyed it because of that uh that the, the focus that it gave me um being there and the people are very warm and friendly i mean like i i i had the opportunity while i was in the usa to go to different states all over i think i must have gone to about 14 to 17 states somewhere around there i can't remember the number of states that i went to but there's a stark contrast between the person from iowa for instance and the person from new york city yeah, I was so much at home in Iowa. You go to other cities and you feel like nobody's noticing you. But in Iowa, everybody right. was coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And when you were in New York City, you probably, you know, I, I'm sure you, you enjoyed your time there. And I know you were you were there, you know, uh, to, to work and also, but maybe to see some of the tourist sites. But you probably said, said to yourself, you know, I really want to get back home to Iowa. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> looking forward to that. So, um, no, I, I definitely understand uh, that. And uh, maybe maybe another thing to say uh, about the School of Urban and Regional Planning. Um, I think it's it's actually called the School of Planning and Public Policy now. It, it had a name yeah. change a few years ago. Is that mm -hmm. it does an excellent job of recruiting international students. Um, I it has a, a large number of international faculty as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say, and I, and I, you know, I'm probably off by a little bit, but anywhere from two thirds to three quarters of the students in the School of, Reg of Urban and Regional Planning are from international destinations. Um, and so I think it, it has a global focus. I mean, clearly you're studying urban and regional planning in the United States, but there's an international dimension uh, to the, the school's mission that I think benefits everyone who comes in yeah. contact with it. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that is really true. I, I had classmates from China, from Haiti, uh, from Nigeria, although, well, not necessarily in my class, but in the, in the same, in the school. Right. Um, yeah, so, but we had people from all over, from, from, from India, you know, people from all over the world. And I think that multicultural setting is really, really good for an international student coming mm -hmm. in for the first time right, to America. Right. Yeah, you find family immediately you land there. I found family just the moment I landed there, the likes of Sunday Goshit, who was very helpful to help me settle in and a very large international community. And we also had um, uh, a very good way of, 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 of having, um, of welcoming them. I remember the InterVarsity Graduate Christian Fellowship. We mm -hmm. welcomed us as, as international students and I, and I was part of that fellowship. So um, I, Iowa, I think, has, has just the right way of actually helping people to settle in yeah, from different cultures. Like, 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 like you said earlier, like I talked about it being, a very, being attracted about the, the intercultural, the multicultural setting there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's always it's always great for us to hear. I mean, we certainly believe it, but but we need uh, validators such as yourself <laughs> to, to to reinforce that message. So we're we're very grateful, you know, that that, that you that you feel this way. Um, yeah. I guess one other question, kind of along those lines, is I'm sure that you've stayed in touch with your friends and colleagues from from Iowa. So I guess I'll, I have two questions. One is, who were your principal mentors? 
at, at Iowa. Um, and how have you stayed in touch with your friends and colleagues uh, since your, your time here? Because you graduated, I think, in 2010, right? So it's been uh, about 12 years, really, uh, yeah. since you were, or at least since you finished your studies here. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. So um, from, from an academic angle, uh, there are two people who that, that really mentored me, and uh, Jerry Anthony. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and Richard Funderberg. Richard Funderberg is no longer there at Iowa. I think he moved on to a different university and mm -hmm. as much as like, but I believe Jerry Anthony is still there. He is. Um, yeah. I like Jerry Anthony's perspective. Jerry Anthony had a, a very balanced perspective because I think he comes from Asia, mm -hmm. from India, yeah, and has lived in America for so long, but he was able to actually bring in that that balance in terms where you know when it came to um, articulating um, the the, the uh, planning needs and planning issues and the like, and I so those were my academic mentors, I, I believe, and then I'm still in touch with both of them actually. Um, then I had the, some special host family. The, there was a host family that first of all welcomed me the first time I came there. The Krogers, I think they're still there. Um, and then I had my mom, my <laughs> adopted mother, Michelle Vasic, and uh, she's I've kept in touch with her and and uh and bob and um uh the husband and they, they were my, my parents there and they, they 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 helped me settle in very very well so on the social angle i was i was at home yeah i was away from family but i found family there that, 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 that that's wonderful that's wonderful <laughs> and have you been back to iowa city since you um started your 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 various positions started your career in in africa no, no, I, I haven't. I, I really, really hope I can one day. Uh, I haven't. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to visiting. <laughs> That's great. Well, we, yeah. we, we would certainly love to have, have you back. Um, yeah. Let me ask you a couple of more questions before we get to the comments from our, uh, from our, our audience. Um, and so back to urban, urban planning um, and thinking about Zambia and Tanzania, uh, in particular, um, and in your work, what would you say are your particular triumphs? What are you proud of in terms of what you've accomplished in both Zambia and Tanzania? And what do you think are the challenges that, that lie ahead? Okay, so um, I think it would be easier for me to talk about the challenges so I can relate the triumph to the challenges. Sure, sure. I, I, I mean, I'd love to be more positive and talk about the triumphs first, but mm -hmm. I need to just create that linkage. Right. Um, I think there's there, there are common issues, the common challenges that, that face Tanzania and Zambia, and these are common to most developing countries. Uh, the, the, the growing population, like mm. Africa is really rapidly urbanizing. And right now it's a center for uh, the focal point of urbanization globally. There's Asia and Africa and region that have this huge, large population growth. And that is placing pressure on, 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 um, on cities, uh, on provision of infrastructure and services to match that growth of population. And unfortunately, we have not invested so well in, 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 in providing those, those frameworks those, mm -hmm. those in, the planning frameworks and um, also the, the provision of infrastructure that, that's the base that would provide a base for 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 for, for more uh, equitable development and also for, for for access to social and economic opportunities for the growing population. So because of that, we have a perpetuated po poverty, and also I, I talked about the the gaps between um, the, the 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 slum slum areas. And uh, and and the, the the other planned neighborhoods, and as it is, uh, around seventy percent of the urban population actually lives in these areas, both in Tanzania mm -hmm. and also in Zambia. It's generally around seventy percent wow. that live in the slums, and so much of urban planning efforts actually in the past. Of course, there was that uh, focus on the more developed areas, but I think there's been a, a, an increasing awareness to to be more inclusive in our planning approaches. So. Um, in Zambia, uh, one of the some of the, the my achievements um, as principal planner 
uh, and also in my other positions that I worked um, in in the Ministry of Local Government was looking at the urban policy environment mm -hmm. and, um, and also the legislative environment. We had adopted a legal framework that that distinguished that 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 that, that created this gap or distinguished the the planned areas from the unplanned areas, meaning that the planning efforts were being made only for the for for the for the for the, for the well-to-do neighborhoods, and then these slums were thought to be illegal developments, as in they are not mm. allowed. So the the approach was to demolish those slums, and but where do the people go once yeah. demolish those? Yeah, so one thing that I, that, that I was involved in was a reform, an urban planning reform, where we looked at having more inclusive urban planning so that we could have a way of bring, bringing in these deprived neighborhoods into the planning system so they could have access also to good roads, uh, to good hospitals, to good social amenities, hospitals, uh, schools, and the like, and have a good living environment. So I was involved in the, in the review of planning legislation and the two, there were two laws, pieces of law that that actually um, we had to revise and merge uh, to to create a harmonized legal framework that could also benefit the people in the in the in the unplanned areas, and then also a preparation of the national urbanization policy for Zambia, uh, which which I left at at a, a kind of almost a final stage, just waiting for approval, which was the first of its kind because we we didn't have a policy in Zambia to guide how we would develop our, our cities uh, uh, to address urbanization and have more sustainable urbanization. So, and also I was involved in um, leading processes of um, integrated development planning. And uh, I was overseeing uh, provinces and local, provincial and local authorities across the country because I was looking at the ministry, which is the central government. And from there, I was, over, I was helping to guide uh, processes of preparing these integrated development plans, which are really just uh, spatial or urban plans or comprehensive plans that like you would call them there in America. So, um, so th those plans were helping to translate uh, the needs of the people, including the, the excluded people in these informal settlements and others um, into a plan that would ensure that they have a physical plan that would ensure that they have all the access to the different amenities that they need to have quality of life in their cities. So that was some of the work that I did. And also I had a significant uh, role in um, putting together our country co contribution towards the new urban agenda. The new urban agenda was arrived at by United Nations system um, mm. in, in 2016. And um, it's, it's, it's an agenda that um, uh, tries to provide a framework to deal with urbanization challenges that, that countries across the world in both developing and developed countries are facing. And it's a 20 year agenda. And I was part of that process, putting together the country contribution towards that, that, that um, went into actually having, that, 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 that was considered as, as um, into the final product of the, which we call the new urban agenda. And that new urban agenda is actually a major um, support to the uh, fulfillment of the SDGs, particularly SDG 11 because it supports the actual uh, the actualization of SDG 11, the, the Sustainable Development Goal number 11. Um, that's just some of the work that I did in Zambia. And um, here in Tanzania, this has been a very, very um, impactful project in the, in the sense that of the scale that the project that I'm involved in is uh, uh, the scale that it covers. The project is a, is a World Bank funded project on improving urban planning and development control systems in the in the whole country of Tanzania, and looking at the whole structure of gov of urban governance from the national level to the regional level down to the city level and below the city level to the actual sub city structures. So trying to find a way of part of that is trying to see how problems of urban informality can be addressed. I talk about this being a common challenge in African countries where we have people mm. living in the slums. And in Tanzania, it's also, also quite prevalent here. We have much of the cities are actually um, informal or unplanned. Right. So, yeah. So, part of this project has been to, to find ways of, um, of, of bringing a bit of more sanity in the planning of the cities so that we have, we move away from the informal to the more, for, to, to more formalized, better planned areas. Uh, for the for the benefits of the residents, and also looking at the systems, the legal frameworks, the structures, 
and the reporting relationships between different institutions and the kind of tools that they are using to practice um, urban planning so that they um, learning from best practices because Ikle Africa, I'm, I'm actually working under Ikle Africa. I didn't mention, I think mm-hmm. you mentioned that earlier on. And so Ikle Africa are the ones actually who are doing this project for the, um, this World Bank funded project for the government of Tanzania. So um, Ikle Africa has, has a wealth of experience being an international organization. So based on that uh, experience, we bring in um, best practices also in the frameworks that we're developing for Tanzania. Uh, so uh, that has been my work here. Uh, so if I look at both Zambia and Tanzania, I think the issues of informality, urbanization issues, and other complex related issues really have been some of the issues that I've been da- dealing with uh, through my work. Right. And so it, it, it kind of gets back to what we were saying before, is that a lot of what you're doing is um, trying to build structures, but making mm-hmm. sure that you know, you're inclusive uh, mm-hmm. when building those those structures. Mm-hmm. So you're going to be dealing with competing interests. There might be corruption involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, there might be, um, you know, uh, s- simply you know issues uh, you know, that that focus on um, just the time needed and the adjustments needed to put mm-hmm. together you know an, an effective plan. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, because because we see this everywhere with urbanization. I mean, the United States is undergoing a lot of urbanization at this mm-hmm. at this time. China mm-hmm. had a mass migration um, mm-hmm. in, in the last decade, where f- mm-hmm. like a half a million people moved from the countryside into the cities, mm-hmm. and that was just you know, and, and the, the planet had never seen anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. You see similar urbanization in uh, uh, in India, in South America. In, in Europe, maybe not to the same extent, but people are moving to cities. And so we've got to be prepared for that, you know, in terms of water, energy, sanitation, transportation. I mean, it's just a, uh, a you know, a huge undertaking. And it almost makes me wish that we had, you know, more urban planners, <laughs> that, that we need to, you know, uh, increase uh, the number of, of, of urban planning programs, or at least the numbers of students and faculty study or involved in them, because otherwise we're not going to be able to meet this meet this challenge. Yeah, that 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 is so true. And um, actually, the growth in urban population is really astounding. Like uh, uh, in Zambia's case, I think we are set to triple by 2050 in terms of the mm-hmm. urban population. So right. the urban population right. will be true for what it is right now. I think right now, right now we're, in terms of numbers, maybe not numbers, but we're, I think we're about 44% urbanized. Mm-hmm. And I think by 20, by 2050, we'll be about, it will be about, about 50, actually, 50, about 50%. But in, in actual numbers, we will actually, we will triple in terms of the population in urban areas. And it's the same, same thing across Africa. I think with the, the African um, rate of growth shows that I think by 20, 2030 will be 50% urban, and then by 2050 it will be 60% urban. But when you actually translate that to numbers, actual numbers and not percentages, it's actually quite a big growth. Right. So if you're saying talking about Zambia growing three times in the next uh, mm-hmm. three, two, two, three, uh, uh, three decades, we need to actually maybe triple the number of urban planners that are being trained. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. because because there's a dual yeah. dynamic. I mean, on the one hand, you've got an increasing population overall, but where is mm-hmm. that increased population going? It's going to cities. So mm-hmm. it's um, it, it's a huge challenge, and we're going to need uh, people like you and many more like mm-hmm. you in order to to meet those challenges. So we only have about five minutes left, but so I wanted to um, get to the questions, um, Mambo, that um, have been forwarded to us either beforehand or in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, Q and A um, mm-hmm. thus far. So, well, first of all, wanted to pass a, uh, pass along a message from your mom here, Michelle. Classic. Um, she had written to us earlier and said, Memba was our adopted daughter here while at U Iowa. We are so very proud of all her accomplishments, as well as just being an amazing human being. We are still very proud of her accomplishments. For her, the sky is the limit. So 
please know that people are still thinking of you here. <laughs> oh, that's 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 so sweet. That's so so sweet. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. hugs from from Michelle and and family uh, here in Iowa City. Um, so, in, in terms of the Q and A, uh, we have a question from Gabriel who says, who asks, how will you manage to achieve your goal while all power and decisions in every area is political in most countries of Africa? Oh, that has been very challenging, and um, uh, there's there's always that conflict or that 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 um, hindrance for technocrats in the in any field, including in the urban planning field, um, to have to convince politicians that you know the best way of doing things is a particular way, because um, they may be sometimes selfish in their decisions and serve their own want to serve their own needs. So it's a it's 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 a pro, it's a continual process of trying to you know to 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 get to get them on board. Uh, I think it's it's um, one can easily fold their arms and say we we'll, we'll let the politicians do their thing. But I think we 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 have a role to play as the voices of those people who are excluded. For instance, we have a role to play for for the urban poor that cannot have a say and being closer to the politicians. I think it's us that have that role to play to actually do that. And uh, I believe. It's only with that continual interacting with the with the politicians, getting them to understand the whole essence and rationale behind, you know, pursuing certain development initiatives. I think eventually one one gets can get to them and you know get things moving in a particular direction. Right, that civic engagement is is really crucial, and mobilizing uh, people politically is crucial mm -hmm. to that to that uh, that project. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, second question from uh, Holly Yoder. Hello, Holly, um, whom I know from the honors program. Uh, she says, I was in Nairobi in August with my future daughter-in-law. We drove past Kibera, famous slum area in Nairobi, and she pointed out some apartments that had been built for residents of the slums. She said that people resisted moving into the new housing and instead rented them out to others and remained in their informal homes. Why might people resist a move to formal housing and what might actually work? So that's usually, I think the case is, first of all, you have not involved the local people because they probably have certain solutions that they'll propose certain solutions that work for them. Um, I believe there's a, there's a cultural setting around the informal environment and that, that they would want to preserve. That neighborliness, and you don't get that in the in the in the in the high-rise buildings. And if those have been imposed on them, there's mm -hmm. no way that they're going to accept them. So I think it's about um, involving the the locals in the process to say what are your problems and what is the best solution um, that we can um, uh, pursue to address your housing challenges or whatever other challenges you're, that they are facing, and work together through engagement. For instance, they may not know the benefits of being moving to that to those new high-rise apartments in the case of Nairobi because they have not been engaged and they don't own, feel like mm -hmm. they own that new project. And also they're being deprived from those social cultural ties that they, they, they've enjoyed in their you know, living environment. So I think engaging them from the very beginning. So whatever solutions that, that are being um, uh, formulated have, have actually been informed by by the locals themselves or by the beneficiaries themselves. Otherwise we end up having white elephants government like puts in so much resources into this yeah right and then it just becomes a corrupt real estate deal um mm -hmm. and we've certainly seen those in 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 this country i mean people have to want to go to a new home they want to they want to have to move you know uh and if it's not their decision well then it just becomes a counterproductive type of uh dynamic so a uh, final question from maria and kevin coomer um they say wonderful work so far have you worked on the challenges about land use and ownership in Tanzania between government and the locals, especially Maasai? Oh, by the way, thank you, uh, Kevin and Maria. Those were very wonderful people to me in Iowa. Mm. I'm glad you tuned in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, land use and land ownership is still very um, di difficult to to um to deal with the issues that do, that come that that arise in terms of land use and ownership here in Tanzania 
because we have a very, very informal or customary kind of land ownership, which is outside the, the state owned land system of government. Yeah, so um, I, I haven't dealt directly with that, but we have proposed solutions about uh, trying to be more inclusive in terms of getting land tenure to this, because most of these people um, that own land like Maasai and, and the like, the, the, the communal land, don't have any secure title um, to that property. So we're trying to see how, how, what are the best solutions for them to actually get a, some form of, 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 of title to that property and, and, and also to recognize them in the planning system uh, so that they can also have the benefits of having a well-planned a well -planned system uh, because of uh, having title to land. So it's some of, some, so those are some of the aspects that my project has been trying to pursue to just find a way of, of also getting government to, to, and, and the owners of these customary pieces of land also to talk to each other and probably even give off their land for any project that may be, that may be needed for, for the community. So it involves a level of, of engagement and yeah. exchange and compromise that yeah. Is, yeah. is definitely, uh, you know, involves a long process, but is certainly yeah. worth it, you know, for the common good. Yeah. yeah. Well, Membo, we couldn't be more pleased to welcome you. This was an absolutely fascinating discussion on a very, very important topic. Um, congratulations on all your success. We're so proud to call you uh, an alum um, and we're delighted that you're still willing to engage with us and be a member of the Hawkeye family. So best of luck to you and your wonderful work. And we hope to see you in Iowa City sometime soon. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. As I look forward to coming to Iowa City soon. Uh, my, I'm, my, my heart is always in Iowa. But, uh, mm. I need to come back home soon. That, that, yeah. that, that, that would be great. And, and we send a, a heartfelt feelings uh, from, from this side of, uh, of the Atlantic. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, we, will, we will stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you so All much. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.